right, looks like we're live. <laughs> Hello, we're live. I'm going to give it a few minutes here before uh, we get started. Hey, Katie. I said six, so we'll give it a few minutes. Can everybody hear me okay? Katie, can you hear me? So I'll try to keep up with comments. If you have a question, throw it out there. Um, this thing doesn't scroll as the comments come in. I have to scroll down and look at them. <clears throat> I'll try to keep up and remember to keep up. Um, Katie, text me. If people start asking questions and I don't see it, throw me a text. I got my cell phone over here, so I'm on my laptop this time. <clears throat> Help me out with that if you would, please, if you're gonna hang out for the whole thing. That would be uh, helpful. If you're watching this later and it's not live on YouTube, you can fast forward just a little bit um, till we go live. I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes here, let people jump on before I jump in. Thank you, Katie. Okay, maybe it does scroll a little bit. When I was live with Will, I wasn't seeing comments until later on. It was weird. I don't like Facebook's new setup on their stuff, but it is what it is. Well, it's 6.01. We will get going. Um, so this is titled Obedience Through Reward. Um, I've talked about reward. Uh, I haven't talked in depth on reward and how we use reward in dog training, but everyone, for the most part, should know that you use rewards in dog training, right? Everyone's trained a dog and gave them a treat, right? Um, so... We're, we're going to get into that and actually really get into the meat and potatoes of that and in the depths of that. So uh, I originally planned on doing a series, a segmented series, on my way to work in the mornings um, because it's a lot of information. And then I'm <clears throat> reviewing my lives in the morning. I've noticed that sometimes they cut out, sometimes they don't. Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, so I decided on this, it would be important to have it not cut out on me. Um, so I decided to do it like this. And I said I was going to do one video and that would be it. However, putting together everything, um, there's just so much that I could cover on this topic that I, I didn't feel a single video would do it justice. And I didn't feel most people would keep up with a single video um, because I can literally talk for hours and hours and hours on reward only. Um, I know some people that blows their mind when we're talking dog training and reward. They're like, it's a reward. You give a dog a treat. No big deal, right? You'll see. Um, bear with me here. We're, we're going to talk about that. So this will be a segment. And I'm sorry. I'm going to be back and forth with my notes, so it's not going to be that professional this time. Next time, I'll try to have a bigger handle on what I'm going to talk about. So I don't have to be so back and forth to my notes. Um, but... As I was putting everything together, I realized it's going to be too, way too long, way too long. So I did need to segment it. And then I realized, then, then I started debating, 
what do I put in and where do I put it in and how do I make it make sense? Um, because I, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, as the segments go, we're gonna dive deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. Um, so today is starting out. So if you happen to be a dog trainer that's watching this, you can, you could probably go. You're not gonna learn anything here. Um, this is gonna be pretty basic. Um, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna cover what is a reward. We're gonna cover reward values, and then we're gonna, uh, cover a little bit of classical conditioning and some, uh, primary secondary reward type stuff. Um, don't worry if you don't understand that. That's, that's for any dog trainers that happen to be on watching right now. I know since my interview with Will and Derek, I've, I've picked up some dog trainers following my page, um. So just for those people, this is really just a pet dog training page. It's not a, a conversation for dog trainers. I like to invite other dog trainers on to talk with me because I think pet dog people get a lot out of that. I think they can. Um, I think they can see uh, what good dog trainers look like and how they talk and how they're, they're, they're moving towards training the dog. Um, because there's a lot of dog trainers out there and people kind of roll into their facility, you contact them and it's like, how do I know they're good? How do I know they're going to do my dog right? Um, so having other dog trainers on and talking to them, I think helps you guys as well. All right. So with no further ado, reward for obedience. Um, what is a reward? Okay. A reward is something you give someone or a dog for doing something good, right? Um, it, it's a way rewards uh, re rewards make behavior happen more. That's their primary function, okay? If you want a behavior to happen more in someone, in a dog, whatever, you reward them, period. Like, that's it. Rewards create repetition in behavior. Punishment diminishes repetition in behavior, if used correctly. Okay, um, so it, it's really important to realize no one works for free, not even dogs, okay? Your dog is never going to love you so much that they're just going to do every bit of behavior for you for free for the rest of their life, and you're going to get to this magical point where your dog's just going to work for you, and you don't ever have to reward that dog because it loves you so much. It's never going to happen. So I, I want that known at the offset here um, because it's a, it's a common misconception in a general public that I can just get my dog to behave um, and I don't have to ever reward my dog. Um, you're going to have to reward your dog. Now, there's ways we can work around that and we can lengthen behavior and the duration of behavior to the reward and that comes later, but that's got to be trained in, okay? Um, so rewards create behavior, and they increase behavior. Um, dogs only do behaviors that are rewarding to them, period. It does not matter what your dog is doing. I don't care unless it has some kind of brain malfunction. Uh, your dog is self-rewarding 24-7, spur of the moment, okay? So as human beings, we can say, I'm not gonna eat that donut today because by January, 2021, I wanna be looking good. That's my goal. Dogs can't do that. Dogs can't look to, by next month, I wanna be in shape and I wanna go nail that uh, obstacle course out there that me and my owner have been training on. It's not gonna happen. Whatever food you put in front of them, whatever reward you put in front of them, they're gonna take it unless that reward is going to make them feel bad, like they've eaten too much, they're too satiated or something. So uh, the more the dog does the behavior that it's doing, the more rewarding the behavior is, or the more solidified the reward schedule is on that, okay? So my dogs in particular, my Mel, um, he loves... And I kind of train this, and it's my dog. I don't care. Don't judge me. My dog will burst out of the back door, full throttle, as hard as he can, run to the tree, jump seven feet up into the tree as hard as he can, barking and biting. Because when he was younger, there were squirrels in the tree. And he, wanted, he found the squirrels. He wanted to bite the squirrels. He wanted to chase the squirrels. 
that's a reward. So I used that to my benefit. Um, and I actually built some drive into that so that I could do some things with him. We'll get into that later on. So that's just a behavior my dog, my personal dog does. He wants to burst out of the back door, run as hard as he can through the, through the yard, and jump as high as he can in the tree. That dog has no clue if there's a squirrel in that tree or not, right? He does that behavior and he does it every single time, never fail unless he's sick or hurt. There's only been very few specific times in his life that he's not ran out that back door like that. Um, so that's a very well, uh, that's a very reinforced behavior, a lot of reward in that behavior. He really wants to catch one of those squirrels and he, just chasing the squirrel is reward in itself. He's never caught a squirrel and killed a squirrel. Um, so in that regard, we need to realize that rewards are in the high of the beholder, right? What's rewarding to you is not rewarding to me. What's rewarding to my dog is not necessarily rewarding to your dog. Every dog is different and every human is different on their reward and what is rewarding to them. So like, I personally, I like black coffee. I don't want sugar and cream and stuff in my coffee. I drink black coffee. Every morning I wake up, if you had a mug of black coffee waiting for me, you're my new best friend. That's a reward to me. That's not necessarily a reward to everyone else, right? Sushi. I love sushi. Like real sushi. Not everybody likes sushi. It's cool. It's rewarding to me. It's not to everybody else. Um, I don't like gum, okay? Gum disgusts me. The action of chewing gum disgusts me. The smell of gum disgusts me. I don't like gum. So if you wanted to be my friend and you were like, hey, you want some gum? I'd be like, oh, no thanks, I appreciate it though. That would not be a rewarding thing for me, right? Um, so everyone, every dog, everything has its own little quirks and its own little reward non-reward things, right? So it's important to know this when you get into dog training because people want to go to Walmart and buy like the big, huge clump chunk sticks of doggy bones and like, yeah, I threw my dog this doggy bone and he chews it up in five minutes and that's how I reward my dog. Is that really rewarding to your dog? Like you have to dig deep there. You have to try some things. Um, because you really need that motivation with that reward uh, or else you're not going to get good uh, obedience out of your dog. So uh, it's kind of like you making, why are you laughing at me, Dan Daniela? It's, it's the difference between you making $10,000 at work or $90,000 at work a year. What do you want to make, right? Dogs are the same way. It's like, what are you going to pay me? Are you going to pay me this big, huge, hard Walmart bone? Or are you going to chop up some raw brisket and throw me chunks of raw brisket or pieces of cheese or uh, freeze-dried beef liver, chicken liver, or something like that, right? You can really raise the values of your rewards and stuff like that. We're going to get into that in a minute, but just keep that in mind. Um not only are they are we different in our likes and dislikes in food, but our likes and dislikes in games, activities, play, things like that. So you also have to keep that in mind with your dogs because toys and play, access to freedom, those are also rewards to dogs. Okay, people don't realize that. Um, I I like to go train dogs like that is rewarding for me other people like to go play basketball and play tennis and some people go golf and some people watch football it's all good those are all rewarding behaviors to those people so some dogs want to play tug some dogs want to chase a ball some dogs want to smell for things um, it, it all depends there's there's multiple things there some dogs just want to run as hard and fast as they possibly can greyhounds some dogs want to hunt right they have, a lot of dogs have a genetic uh, bred in trait that they can't help but absolutely love to do. So those are rewarding behaviors. Keep those things in mind um, when working with your dog. Um, the one thing 
the one thing we all have in common, whether it's me and you, you and your dog, dogs and dogs, it doesn't matter. There's one thing we all have in common when it comes to reward, and that is to eat for survival, okay? We all want dinner, we all want breakfast, we all want lunch, right? We have to have that food, that sustenance that makes us continue living, okay? That's the one thing, the one key we have in common um, is eating for survival. It's called existential food, all right? That's the food we consume to continue living, all right? That's your dog's dog food. How simple would it be to train your dog with the kibble you buy already? right? And this kind of blows people's mind. It blew my mind the first time I heard it. Um, so I want to make it absolutely clear. We do not starve dogs. 100% you do not starve dogs. All right. So you have your existential food you can train with, and it basically boils down and I'm going to I'm going to make this real simple, but I'm going to expound on it a little bit later. It breaks down to either you're going to work for me and access your food as you work throughout the day, or you're not gonna get your food. It's plain and simple, okay? No dog, there is no dog in history, unless it has a mental illness or some kind of sickness that is going to starve themselves to death intentionally, just to spite you. Oh, you want me to work for you? I'll <laughs> show you, human. I'm not gonna eat that food, I'll lay here and die. There's no dog that's gonna do that, okay? So I like to use existential food for training, and I do use existential food for training. That's not my only thing I train with, but I do use it. It's a big factor in my training. Um, treat training, that's the, the whatever. Um, I have freeze-dried beef liver here. These are really good, they're really healthy. I like training with healthy stuff with my dogs. I don't, I don't go buy the, uh, the, uh, I don't even know what they are now. I haven't bought that stuff in so long. Anything you get in tractor supply, anything you get in Walmart that's a doggy treat type stuff, um, the pepperonis and the, they're horrible. Like these are horrible, horrible food for your dog. So I don't, I don't buy those. Um, I have been known <laughs> in the past and, and I still use it today. If I have really super picky dogs, I will buy an entire brisket, a $30 brisket, and I will cut it up into little bitty small chunks uh, and put them in Ziploc baggies and like this, and then like freeze the baggies. And as I need them for that dog, pull them out for treats, for treat training style stuff. Uh, raw brisket, raw chicken. Uh, uh, I love the freeze dried or the dehydrated liver stuff. Uh, I don't get carried away with those because those can also be damaging for a dog, but dogs go crazy for them for treat training, uh, stuff like that. The greenies are awful, that kind of thing. I don't buy any of that. I don't use any of that. Um, toys, play, that's all rewarding behavior. Uh, water, just allowing your dog to access water is a reward, okay? It can be used as a reward. Um, affection is a reward. Uh, access to freedom or the environment, just they want to be able to access something in the environment or they just want to be allowed to go run around and play and be a dog, that is a reward, okay? Uh, going to the bathroom. People don't realize that going to the bathroom is a reward to your dog. Like relieving yourself is rewarding, right? When you gotta go, you gotta go, and you're sitting there holding it. You're like, oh my God, when is this meeting gonna end? I gotta go to the bathroom. And then you finally go to the bathroom and you're like, ah, thank God, right? Going to the bathroom is rewarding. Keep that in mind. Um, before we get into reward, before we get into using reward for training, what we need out of our dog though, is we need ignition, all right? Ignition from a dog is key, absolutemental, absolute fundamental for dog training, all right? If your dog doesn't have ignition, if your dog doesn't want to do the training, if your dog doesn't want to do what's called engage with you, look at you, pay attention to you, be with you, be a part of what's happening. If you can't get your dog to do that, like no training can occur, all right? That's why I love puppies really, really young because puppies 
are like little kids. Little kids always want to be with you. They always want to be doing what you're doing, right? Puppies are the same way. They want to be there. They want to be involved. They want to be a part of it. Come on, let's do it. This is great, right? As dogs get older, they find their very own rewarding behaviors. They continue to do those rewarding behaviors. Um, and they have learned usually that you're not very rewarding. They just go do their own things. So why do I want to pay attention to you? I never get anything from you. And I know you think, well, I love on my dog and I give my dog this big food, dog bowl of dog food every day. And I give my dog all these toys and they're scattered all over. My dogs love me because I do everything for my dogs, but that's not the case. Okay. Um, if you're doing all of those things, your dog doesn't give a crap about you. I'm sorry to say, but your dog and your dog's mind, in your dog's mind, you don't matter. Those things are just there, all right? They, they're there and they have access to them. They don't remember that, oh yeah, three weeks ago, Sally bought me this little toy and I really like it. Man, she's great. It's just like, that's my toy. It's in my environment. It's here and I play with it. I don't care about the human. The human has nothing to do with it. It's all me, all right? And when you have a dog in that mindset, you can't train. So you have to bring a dog out of that mindset. You do that through ignition, all right? Um, so to get ignition out of a dog, you have to have value in rewards, all right? You have to have the something the dog wants. You have to make it to where the dog wants to be with you and be a part of you. So how do you get there? So this is like first step in dog training, all right? Um, because each reward has different values to dogs, you should be able to line your rewards up for your dogs and figure out which is more valuable, okay? Um, so some rewards I use, these are toys. This is the Chuck It Ball. This is an awesome, awesome toy. Just be careful with these. These have been known, dogs have been known to go after them so hard that they get lodged in their throat. Um, they make a square one now. They can't do that. If you can find the square one and it has this that clicks into the square, it's pretty cool. Um, but this is fine. Ball on a string. I can throw it. They can fetch it. I can play tug with it. Great, great device. One of my favorites. My dogs highly value this. Um, between these two, I would say this is probably more valuable to Kaya, my female, and this is probably more valuable to my male Sam. Um, to my male Sam, this is his wedge. We play tug with this wedge. He bites it, and it has handles that I can hold on to, and we can play back and forth. This is one of his favorite toys. It's very hard. It's very rigid. He can bite in real deep. Um, he's got kind of a little pinchy mouth, so the wedge helps. He, li he likes that for his size mouth. My female, she's got a big old mouth. I won't make any comments, ladies. No. Um, my female, this is her favorite tug right here. This big old huge barrel tug all right she's got this mouth that's like a square jaw and i mean like she loves this thing she cannot get enough of this thing um she will play with the triangle but she prefers this um for puppies and stuff i have this is just like a regular puppy tug um i don't have any more i need to get some more i had some little bit thicker tugs these usually come with handles on the end, on this one, I cut the handles off so I could actually play tug with the dog without the handles. Uh, because if it has these little, like this guy right here has these hanging off, so puppies go after that, that's really fun looking. Access is their prey drive. So if you have a handle over here, uh, I don't want to bite here, I want to bite here. So you cut the handles off and then it's like, okay, I bite there. Um, so that, that's kind of some toys I have for my dogs kind of things. Um, now, I said those are toys for my dogs. They're toys for my dogs, but they're not my dog's toys. I want to make that clear, all right? Those are my toys, period. My dogs access those toys through me and through me alone. They don't hang out around my house. I can have them out around my house. They won't go get them because I haven't released them to them, okay? Um, everything my dogs receive in life, they receive through me, period. You can take this training to whatever level you want 
for a pet dog. Um, existential food. So this is this is a daily meal for one of my dogs. They both get fed the same amount. This is three cups of dog food. Um, so I have people. I ask in my uh, training application online, I ask how much you feed a day and how many times a day you feed. And I get people that tell me they feed uh, one cup a day or two or three cups a day. And is it a cup, like a measuring cup? Or is it a cup? <laughs> There's a big difference there, right? So on the back of the dog food, you need to be feeding off of what's recommended on the back of your dog food bag, okay? So like the back of my dog food bag is 40 to 60 pounds, should be two and a quarter cups, cups, to three cups, and for 60 to 80 pounds, three cups to three and three quarter cups, okay? So my dogs both get three cups. Now my male gets a little extra stuff in his, but we won't go into that. Um, so existential food, this would be broken up throughout the day if I'm training with this, and then I have treats for training, okay? Um, when you're training a dog, you need to, to know where your dog's at in its behavior for which reward you use, okay? So like, Kaya goes crazy, absolutely crazy for this thing. If I were to try to use this barrel tug to teach her a brand new behavior that she has never practiced, never known in her life, if I pulled this out and said, we're learning something brand new today, my dog would lose her mind. There is no way I could teach my dog a brand new obedience behavior, like a sit, down, stand, come to heel, whatever it may be. There's no way I could teach her something, a brand new that she doesn't already know, okay? I would start here. We're gonna learn something new and we're gonna practice that and we're gonna practice it for a long time. And when she does really good, I'm gonna give her one of these because they're really super tasty and she doesn't get them all the time. And then when she knows the thing pretty good, then we'll move to this to proof it, okay? And proof it means like to make sure she really knows it. Her, she can, even with her head kind of crazy and excited, like I can still do what I'm supposed to do. Um, so what I just described is kind of stacking rewards is what we call them. It's taking reward values. It's taking a reward by its value and rewarding the dog in different values for the behavior based on how they know, what they know, the clarity of the mind, things like that, okay? So like, I can take this and I can take it from a, here, here's your food, take your food out of my hand to a, take the food, oh, chase it, they gotta go after it. Now I just put more reward into this reward. So let's say this reward had a value of a three. You did it right, take the food. And then they go to take it and I go, boom, and they have to chase it and take it. Now I just took that three to a five. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to everybody. So you can actually play with the values of the reward, okay? The more exciting you are, the more you put play into it, or are you boring and stand there stiff? So you can make a reward that's a two or three you can make it rise in value to a four, five, six, depending on you and what you do with the reward. Okay, same with these. These are gonna be a four, five on your scale of one through 10 uh, versus just your two, three out of the dog food just by simply giving it. So if it's already a four, five, and then you put some play in it, now you're raising it to a six, right? And then you take your seven, eight on your scale and you just say, sit, yes, boom, she bites it right there in your hand, or you say, yes, boom, and then jerk it away, and she has to chase you with it and things like that. You can raise and play with those values and stuff. That way you can keep your dog in a certain mindset, and then as they're clear, and as they're doing their behavior, then you can up that reward value and make the dog feel like, ah, oh, this is great, I really like this. Um, 
that way you're not you're not the boring teacher. I tell people, don't be the boring teacher, right? We all had the teacher in class that sat there and mur, 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 mur. And then we had the teacher that joked with you and laughed with you and cut up in class and told stories about their life and found different ways. You gotta be the fun teacher to your dog, okay? You can't just be the boring teacher to your dog. Um, so another way that you can create more value and rewards and people don't freak out on me is deprivation, okay? Um, and when I say that, people automatically go to bad thoughts, bad thoughts, bad thoughts, right? Depriving your dog of something is not a bad thing, okay? Depriving your dog from access to free roaming the house is not a bad thing. Depriving your dog from free eating 24 seven out of a bowl that, yeah, out of a bucket you dumped a whole bag of dog food in isn't a bad thing. Depriving your dog from just chewing on toys willy-nilly around the house is not a bad thing, okay? When you take those things away and then you tell your, you, your, you show your dog like, hey, you can access these things. They're still here. You can come out in the house, but you have to act a certain way. You can play with your toy, but only through me, and you have to do these things to have access to this toy through me. And you can have this food, but you have to do these things to access this food and you access it through me. And when you show a dog that, they get more involved with you and suddenly you become their world. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. I take my dogs places and everybody always comments like, your dogs never take their eyes off of you. Like there has to be something pretty big going on in the environment for my dogs to look away from me and not be just staring at me constantly. That's because they're waiting. They're waiting because they know this dude has good things. He always gives me good things. And as long as I wait and have, I, all my dogs have hope. They have tons of hope. Something good is coming from this guy. It's coming. I just have to wait. And I did that through years of repetition, 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 right? So I deprived them of, no, you don't get to go hang out with strangers and jump all over them and lick on them and bite them and jump on them and crap like that. You stay with me. You don't get to go play with other dogs. Uh, you play with me. You don't get to eat whatever, whenever. You eat what I give you when I give it to you. Um, and then it's very clear to dogs. That is very clear language to dogs because they're not humans, okay? You're not taking and locking your child in the bedroom. You're not taking and telling your child, no, you can't have a snack. Dogs think differently than people. Um, so when I say deprivation, don't freak out there. Um, dogs, depending on where they are in their training, should not have access to free roam your house. You should kennel train, okay? If your dog has to lay in a kennel and be off and just be cool and do nothing, he doesn't have toys in there. He doesn't have anything in there to do. No stimulation, okay? Kennel time is just chill time. You don't do anything. You don't try to make it fun for them. You know, it's just off time. And then when you come home and you let your dog out of the kennel, boom, let's have some fun. And you get that burst of energy out and you let your dog be a dog, but you let, it, let your dog be a dog through doing things you want them to do. They get to do that burst of energy, doing these fun things they've done, these sits and downs and stays and heels and access to the reward and they're having fun with you. Whoa, it was a good time and we went out and we played for 15 minutes and now you come back in and now you chill in the living room and watch TV and your dog hangs out because we don't do those things in the house, right? So keep in mind where you train and where you train your dog. That's why a lot of my training videos, most of my training videos you see out in my yard because I train dogs outside and then inside is chill time. Any videos you see of me inside with a dog, I may be doing a few little sits and stuff like that, but the dog's usually on a place bed, it's doing duration type stuff, it's, it's calm obedience, right? So people bring me their dogs and they say, my dog's crazy, good luck training my dog. You don't know the energy this dog has. I love that, I love to hear that. You have no idea how happy that makes me when I hear that. Because it's harder to take a dog 
that has no ignition, right? A dog that already just kind of lays around. He doesn't really care about food. He doesn't care about toys. He doesn't really want to go outside. He just kind of chills. It's like, what obedience really do you want to put on that dog? But I have people bring me those dogs. So I have to create ignition in that dog. I have to create a want and a desire in that dog. Um, but you bring me a dog that's already pin up, never gets any attention, has all this, you know, just tons of energy pouring out of them. And I show them how to channel that. Just channel it, just hold it. And I'm going to let you burst it. And I'm going to let you be a dog and I'm going to let you run and jump and play and go after the toy. And we're going to chase food and do food games and stuff like that. And those dog, those dogs fall absolutely head over your girls in love with me. And I love those kinds of dogs. So as a trainer, I know that is my downfall. That is my Achilles tendon. Getting a dog that's kind of lazy and bringing those drives out of them is a lot harder for me personally than taking a really super active, wild, crazy dog and saying, yeah, you can, you can have that part of your personality that's perfectly acceptable. And it is perfectly acceptable. As a dog, to have that, whoa, that joy of life, that's great. That's what dogs are supposed to be. Dogs are supposed to have that, but not all the time, right? So it's got to be that balance there. So imagine that you were just a happy person, like you were a positive person, upbeat person, and the people you lived with were constantly like, no, you can't be like that. No, think negatively. No, you can't be excited about this. Just sit down. Just sit still. Don't move. You know what I mean? What kind of life would that be for you? Like, it would be horrible. To me, that would be a horrible, horrible life. So don't give that to your dog. You don't want to make your dog just constantly just be there. You have to let your dog have those opportunities to be a dog, to do dog things, to have fun, just to, you know, take them out and, you know, give them that, that three minutes of just an obedience thing for play and then say, boom, we're done and release them to the environment to go be in the environment and be a dog in the environment. That's a huge reward for dogs. Um, so how do we get there, right? How do you communicate with your dog for those rewards? And that is through classical conditioning, okay? So everything we've gone over so far, the food, the toys, all of that that we use for training a dog, those are all called primary reinforcers, uh, primary reinforcers or the primary reward, okay? I try to say reward for you guys, but in the dog world, as dog trainers, we say reinforcers, okay? It's their reinforcement. But I'll try to say reward um, if I get off. So primary reward. These are the foods, the toys, all of that. That's primary reward, okay? So what we do as dog trainers is we create a communication system with your dog. So that's, that's one of the first things I do. I get ignition and I create a communication system. Those are the first two things I do. I can usually do those two things pretty simultaneously. Um, so we do that through classical conditioning. I knew I was forgetting something. And that's my clicker. Bear with me just a second, guys. I'm gonna find my clicker. If I can, I usually have 30 of them laying around. No way. I cannot believe I did that. Um. So I don't have a clicker. Man. All right. So a clicker is just a little device in your hand that you hold, and it's mechanical. It's plastic with a little button, and it's got like a little piece of metal, and you hit the button, and it just goes click, okay? Um, man. I'm missing comments down here. Sniffing for Benito. That's right. He's a, he's a hunter. Um, so we have our clicker, right? So you have options in dog training. You, if you've never heard of clicker training, it's, it's just a clicker. It's a device you have in your hand and it just goes click, 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 okay? So classical condition comes from a scientist, uh, Pavlov, Pavlovsky. He was doing uh, enzyme tests on dog saliva and he was getting saliva from dog's mouths through tubes and stuff, all right? So the guy came in every day to feed the dogs. And as soon as the guy came in to feed the dogs, before he had food in his hand, anything, he was just a different guy, no lab coat, things like that. As soon as he came in, 
even if he came in and didn't feed the dogs on the left, as soon as he came in, the dogs knew that's the guy that feeds us. They would start salivating because they were expecting uh, the food to come, right? They had hope of the food, so they'd just start salivating. Pavlov noticed this and was like, man, I need to get that on cue. How do I get that on cue? So he rang a bell, fed the dog, rang a bell, fed the dog, rang a bell, fed the dog. That's it. And pretty soon, after a little while, he could ring the bell and the dogs just start slobbering, okay? That's classical conditioning in its simplest form. We're going to get deeper into that later, too, so bear with me. Um, so the bell, the clicker, or in, tra in uh, dog training, we use a verbal, what's known as a verbal mark. So like for my dogs, it's an okay or a yes or something like that. It's just a word that signals like yes. Yes is a very uh, uh, popular verbal marker, okay? Because you're literally telling your dog yes. Your dog, you tell your dog to sit, its butt goes on the floor and you say yes. Like that is what I wanted, yes. Your dog gets up and it comes gets a reward from you. Okay, it's that simple. But you have to go through a stage of what's called loading the secondary marker, okay? So the secondary marker announces the coming of the primary, the secondary reward, <laughs> not marker, the secondary reward or reinforcer uh, announces the coming of the primary reward, okay? And it's completely uh, conditional on the primary reward. So, well, I'll come back to that. So we're talking about loading the secondary reward, the marker, okay? So to do that, you simply just have your dog in front of you, and you click, and you give some food. And your dog kind of looks at you, you click and give some food. Your dog, I'm not, I'm not, I usually, I don't ask for any behavior when I'm loading a marker, okay? All I want is just, just look at me, just pay attention to me. Be in the room with me, look at me. And I click and give a reward. Click, give a reward. So that's why we use food a lot. Uh, that's, that's one of the other reasons for clarity of mind and for repetition. That's why we use food. That's why food's a big one. Um, because if I'm playing with my dog for reward in the beginning, like I tell my dog to sit his butt goes on the floor and I say yes, or I click the clicker and the dog accesses the tub, now I have to sit there and play tug with my dog for a second. Then I have to get him to release the tug. Then I have to ask him again. So with food, I can just go, sit, yes, here, sit, yes, here's some food. Sit, yes, here's some food. Click, sit, yes, here's some food. I can do that over and over and over really, really fast. I can hammer out repetition. And repetition is the key to dog training. Um, so the marker creates a communication system with the dog. We go around constantly telling our dogs, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. No, don't, don't, no, don't do that. You know what I mean? But when's the last time you told your dog yes? When's the last time you told your dog yes? That is exactly what I want from you. Do that more. That's what dog training is, okay? Um, we create behaviors in the dog, and we make those behaviors come more prevalent in the dog's life, and then we try to diminish all the bad behaviors we don't want out of the dog. So that's why we like getting puppies because then we can set puppies up to just do good behaviors and they never do the bad behaviors. So you don't ever have to worry about them. With older dogs, they usually have the bad behaviors and now we gotta take those away as we create new behaviors. Um, so timing, uh, we use classical conditioning. We use markers primarily for timing, okay? Because dogs are millisecond thinkers they're 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 in the moment okay so if you you're teaching your dog to sit and you say sit and your dog's butt hits the floor you want to mark as soon as your dog's butt hits the floor and then give food so you don't have to like as soon as your dog's butt hits the floor you're shoving food in the dog's mouth because you want to make a clear picture to the dog okay a trainer another trainer i can't remember who said it Put it this way, it's like taking a picture for the dog, okay? Dogs are all pictures. They think in pictures. <gasps> so you tell your dog, sit, and its butt goes on the floor, and you click, click. That's the picture I want. That's what I want to see from you. Here's your reward, right? So you you have to, like, timing is key. And with a, with a mark, classically conditioned, with a mark, with a secondary reinforcer, you can mark those behaviors, like, perfectly 
and then give your dog a reward afterwards. And the dog still knows, like, I'm receiving this reward because of what I did back there, because the click told me that, or the yes told me that, or the bell told me that. Um, so when you're doing this, when you're loading the mark, and when you're starting out with brand new behaviors, you want super short sessions, okay? You want ignition, you want the dog to be paying attention, you want the dog to be engaged with you, and you also want your sessions to be short. So by short, I'm talking like two minutes, two and a half minutes, but multiple sessions throughout the day. Um, so like, if I had a dog come in and they were a 60 pound dog getting three cups of food a day, I would take this amount out and put it in a training pouch, okay? Throughout the day, he would get short little two-minute sessions and eat all of his food as long as he was engaging with me. If the dog come out of the kennel and I was like, are you ready to work, buddy? Like, here it is. We can do this. And the dog's like, nah, I don't care. I don't want any of that. I even click once and the dog's like, no, thank you. I'm not taking your food. That is completely and totally the dog's choice, and it is 100% fine. The dog goes back to the kennel, and he lays there until the next session. And when the next session comes out, it's like, here's your opportunity again. It's your choice. So we're sort of taking the choice away from the dog, but we're also giving the dog the choice, if that makes sense. Um, and the dog starts choosing like, okay, this is pretty fun. This is an outlet. This is something to do. Um, I, I'll get on board with this. And then you make it exciting, you make it fun, um, and the dog really starts loving it. And then the dog's loving life because when you do that for a dog, it takes the dog's crazy, hectic, unsecure life that it's never sure of anything. Like, I don't know, every once in a while I walk in that room and they scream at me and I don't know why, right? Dogs don't know... I don't want you to go in the bathroom. Uh, as, as, as people, we assume dogs know a lot more than what they actually know, um, especially starting out with us. So like one of the things people do is, I don't know, my dog keeps peeing in my house. I throw it out in the backyard, it sits at the door and it won't go use the bathroom. Why does it not go use the bathroom? And then I let it in and it goes over and pees. Well, what makes you think your dog knows that you're letting it outside to go to the bathroom? Like really? Think about that. When did the dog learn that you letting it out of the house means go to the bathroom? So I teach go to the bathroom by taking my dog out on a leash, taking it to the spot in the yard. I want it to go in the bathroom and I walk it around in a circle and I wait. And I know my dog probably needs to go to the bathroom because I've waited until it's probably about time it needs to go to the bathroom. And then as soon as my dog goes to the bathroom, I go, good, hurry up. Good job, buddy good, hurry up, and I make a big deal out of it, and they get done, and they get petted, and good, hurry up, and here's some treats and some rewards. And then we walk around the yard for a minute, and then we go back inside, and then we go out and do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and now I'm to the point with my dogs where I can be on a trip out of town and stop at a roadside, at a gas station, in a strip of grass this big, this wide, and I'm in a hurry. I just need to get gas and go, and I can get my dog out and say, go hurry up. And my dog goes, okay. And it goes. And we get back in the car and we drive away. And there's no extra sniffing around. What's that over there? Ooh, how about that over there? My dogs don't do that. They get out, go hurry up, they go hurry up. Go potty, they go potty. It's whatever you want to call it, right? So you have to train that. Um, and then keep them kenneled. Dogs don't like being in their own feces. Dogs are clean animals. They don't like laying in their own feces and stuff. So if you have them kenneled and then you take them out to use the bathroom and bring them back in, they know, like, I have hope he's going to take, they're going to take me out to use the bathroom. Um, so that pretty much wraps up today. Um, that's about as far as I'm going to go. I will say this, keep it fun and keep it short, okay? Loading your mark should take a day or two, no more than two days. If, you're, if you've gone two days and your dog doesn't know what the mark is, you're doing it wrong. It's really simple. People get it wrong. That's why people bring in your dogs to train for them. Because I can tell you, it's simple. You get your dog in front of you and you go, click here. Click, here's some food. Click, here's some food. And you do that for a minute and then you go put them up in a kennel. And then you get them back out 
And then you say you're ready to work and then you click and give some food and you click or you say yes and you give some food and you say yes and you give some food. But people don't get this. Um, so it should take no more than two days. After two days, you can start adding behaviors like s telling your dog to sit and saying yes and rewarding them for that or telling your dog to down and saying yes when they down, that kind of thing. Um, two days, two days tops. Um, if you're doing two to three minute sessions multiple times a day, two days, you should be good to go. At the end of two days, you should be good to go with that dog unless something's really, really weird or really, really off. Um, keep your session short, keep them fun. If the dog's getting bored, think of it like you're going out with your friend, your buddy, right? Or you meet somebody. <laughs> You meet somebody for the first time and they're like, hey, let's go hang out. And you're like, all right, cool. Seems like a cool, cool dude. I'll go hang out with him. You go hang out and they're like, hey, can you help me rearrange this living room while you're here? And we move furniture all day. And I'm like, all right, man. Well, thanks for coming by. See you later. And you leave and you're like, that was not fun. I got no reward. I was made to do these things. It wasn't really that great. How many times? And then you're like, okay, maybe it was a fluke and you come back again. And the next day you help the guy clean out his garage. Like how many times are you going to go back to these people's house and hang out with this dude before you're like, I don't want anything to do with this guy. It's no fun, right? Dogs are the same way. So keep it fun, uh, but keep it just fun enough. Uh, I try not to cheerlead my dogs too much. I try not to be like, hey, come on, let's play. Let's let's train. You want to train? Because then dogs get used to that. And when you're like, hey, let's train, and you're in the grocery store and you don't want to be doing that with your dog, your dog's looking at you like, I don't want to do this. But you can do certain little stuff with your dog to, to make it feel better. And then with the short duration, you put them up. Like as soon as your dog's doing really, really good, Go put them away because the next time you get them out they're going to be like i remember this this was a lot of fun i really want to do this and they're going to have that passion but if you're hanging out with somebody that you go out with them and it's a blast and you have fun and then at three o'clock in the morning you're like i am tired i can't do this anymore and they're like no come on let's keep going and at five o'clock in the morning you finally get home and you're like oh my god and then they're like, hey, let's go out again another weekend. And you're like, okay, cool. I had fun. We'll go do that. Two o'clock in the morning rolls around and you're like, dude, I'm done. I got to go home. And they're like, no, come on, let's keep going. Five o'clock, you get home. The next time that rolls around, hey, you want to go hang out again? You're going to be like, I can't take this person. Like, I can't do this. It's not fun anymore, right? So don't take your dog over that threshold. You want to do just enough with your dog that they're having fun and having a good time and then go, all right, that's it. Good job, man. Go put them away. And then the next time they come out, they're going to want to hang out with you. They're going to want to do this again. It was fun last time. It's going to be fun this time. Keep that in mind. Um, and trust me, there's more to come. We're not done here. We're not even close to being done on reward. We're going to dive deep. Uh, we're going to dive deeper into classical conditioning and what you can really do with it and some cool stuff. Um, we're going to talk about negative and positive rewards. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff to come. Uh, I'm not even sure how many series this will be yet. Uh, hopefully next time I'll know how many uh, series this will actually be. Um, so, yeah, I don't see any questions. I didn't get any questions, so hopefully it was clear as mud. And we'll see. We'll find out. If anybody does have questions, hit me up in Messenger, uh, whatever. And go to YouTube. This will be on YouTube. Um, the whole series will be on YouTube. Go to YouTube. Like my YouTube page and stuff like that. Follow there because I'll be, I'll be putting things out there too. Um, I may be creating some content specifically for YouTube. Just some uh, pre-recorded stuff. Me sitting down talking without an audience and really diving deep into some concepts and stuff. Uh, I'm thinking about it. We'll see if that happens. Um, uh, I have a lot on my plate already. But, yeah, go go check out my YouTube page, Instagram. You're on Facebook. So I guess that's it. No, no questions. So uh, this was fun. I can't wait for Series 2. See you all next time.